This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Our guests are Sister Helen Prejean, one of the world's most well-known anti-death penalty activists. She's a Catholic nun. Uh, she wrote the book Dead Man Walking, the eyewitness account of the death penalty that sparked a national debate. It's the 20th anniversary of its release, and it's just been released anew. It has a new preface by Archbishop Desmond Tutu, making comparisons of the death penalty in this country with the old South Africa. We're also joined by Bill Pelkey, who is with us in a Chicago studio, but was in Indiana this week when Paula Cooper um, was released. Paula Cooper uh, murdered his grandmother, Ruth Pelkey, when um, Paula was 15 years old. Uh, she was convicted, sentenced to death, and became the young youngest person on death row. Bill Pelkey was among those who pleaded for her life to be spared and is in Indiana to meet with Paula. Nermeen? Uh, Bill Pelkey, can you say a little about how the work of Sister Helen Prejean affected your own work and your own advocacy on the question of the death penalty? Sure. Um, while Paula Cooper was on death row, um, I, I campaigned very heavily, went to Italy three times on her behalf. When Paula was taken off of death row in the fall of 1989, I thought, well, that's it. She's off of death row. My mission's been accomplished. And was, that was about the time I heard about a march that's going to take place in Florida, start off at death row in Florida, and go to Atlanta, Georgia. And the purpose of the march was to ignite the spiritual consciousness of churches in America about the issue of the death penalty. And I felt, well, there's spiritual reasons why I was opposed to the death penalty. I ought to be there. And so I took two weeks' vacation from Bethlehem Steel in Portage, Indiana, drove to Florida to be part of that march, and that's where I met Sister Helen Prejean. And after 17 days of walking down the highways with this nun, uh, you get a real education about the death penalty. And I was on that march with Sister Helen Prejean, where I dedicated my life to the abolition of the death penalty and said, as long as there's any state in this world that's killing their own citizens, I want to stand up and say that it's wrong. And I've been working against that ever since. Bill Pelkey, now that Paula Cooper is released from prison, she'll face new challenges such as finding employment given her criminal history. I want to ask you about the Ban the Box movement, the movement that's seeking to ban employers from asking potential employees to check a box indicating if they have a criminal past. In this clip from a short film called Beyond the Box, a formerly incarcerated man explains the difficulties he encountered in the job market because of his criminal history. My name is Donald. I'm 43 years old. Um, recently just came back to society from doing um, oh, quite a few years in prison. My first three weeks out, I put in seven applications. I haven't got a call back once from anything. No feedback whatsoever from any of the applications I put in. I get up in the morning, um, headed to my destination, which is in advanced employment class. Okay. This is something I've been looking forward to doing. When I say I want to be whole, I want to be a whole person. I want to wake up in the morning knowing I got a place in society. I'm accepted. Bill Pelkey, can you talk about that movement, the ban the box movement? Well, this is the first time I've heard about it, and I can definitely understand why there would be a movement in that direction. I mean, I know it's going to be very difficult for Paula Cooper to, to find a job. When people want to know her past history and find out she spent 28 years in prison, uh, they are going to be hesitant to, to hire her, especially in the, in the market today. Um, but I really uh, don't know about the, the ban the box. Um, I, I think employers probably have a right to know if a person has, a, has done something violent in their past, but they've paid their price, and I don't think it should be held against them. What do you plan to say to Paula Cooper, um, Bill, when and if you meet her? Or do you have a plan to meet her? Well, I came uh, from Spain uh, here to Indiana uh, to meet with her on my way back to Alaska. I don't know if I'm going to be able to meet with her or not. Um, she was, when she left the prison, she went to a, a safe place. Um, I hope to hear from her in the next uh, four days before I go back to Indiana. But if, if I see her, I will give her a hug and welcome her. Uh, into, back to, the, to society and uh, reassure with her that I'll do anything I can do to help her be successful. What were your meetings with her, your visits with her like when she was in prison? Well, I tried to visit with her for eight years. Uh, the Department of Corrections in the state of Indiana would not allow us to visit. 
but as a result of a, of a film that Susan Sarandon narrated called From Fury to Forgiveness where they went into the prison and asked the warden why I couldn't visit with her, uh, the warden act shocked but said next time I applied to visit I could and so on Thanksgiving Day of 1994 we had our first visit. Uh, when I went into the prison I knew you could give the person a hug when you went in and one of the statements Paul Cooper had made on that video was I would like to look him in his eyes and know that he has forgiven me and I gave her a hug, I stepped back, I looked her in the eyes, I told her that I loved her and I had forgiven her. I've never talked to her about the crime, we've talked about other things that we have in common. And you've also spoken to her regularly on the telephone, is that right? Uh, once a week? Um, no, I've never spoken to her on the telephone, but we have corresponded while she was on death row. We wrote letters uh, exchanged about every 10 days. In the prison ah, yes, system uh, in Indiana, something called JPay. It's like an email system, and we do correspond through this JPay system uh, once a week. Helen Prejean, as you listen to Bill's story, and you do your own escorting of people on death row, or what, what do you call it uh, when you are with people on death row? Uh, spiritual advice, spiritual accompaniment. Talk about um, the murder victims' families. I mean, we're hearing Bill. He's the grandson of Ruth Pelkey. But with Dead Man Walking, for example, do you feel that you made any mistakes at that time? Absolutely. At first, I mean, I had never been engaged in public debate. I had never been engaged with people in prison. So I meet a man on death row who's done an unspeakable crime, but I knew about his dignity. I didn't know what to do with the victim's family. I thought, well, they're going to hate me because I'm the spiritual advisor to the one who killed their children. And I avoided them because I just thought I'll bring them more pain. There'll be a big old, well, can't you support the death penalty? Don't you understand? that justice to be done, that our, he deserves to die for killing our child. And I couldn't picture myself, Hannah, and I avoided him. It was a terrible—the worst mistake of my life, hands down. Because when I did meet them, it was the most polarized situation you could imagine. It was a, a pardon board hearing, the last, before Pat was to be executed a week later. And you, you sign a book when you go in for a clemency board hearing in Louisiana. If you're for life or death, literally, I think it's the closest you come, like to being in a Roman amphitheater, you put your thumb up for a person to live and your thumb down for them to die. And everybody in the room, except me and a lawyer and one psychiatrist, was there to see Patrick Sonier die. And the victim's family was caught in the current, too, because they're told this is the way you honor your dead child. This is the way you get justice. And it's a very societal thing, and victims' families were caught in it. I met them outside the building while the pardon board was voting, and one of the families, the girl's parents, furious at me, and I deserve their anger. But I was unprepared for the father. He's the hero of Dead Man Walking, Lloyd LeBlanc, who had lost David, his only son. His family name died with the death of David. And he said, Sister Helen, all this time you've been visiting with those two brothers, and you never once came to see us. You can't believe the pressure on us to be for the death penalty. And I didn't know. I said, oh, Mr. Bob, I'm so sorry. He said, my wife and I even go to different masses on Sunday to see if we could hear some priest talk about the message of Jesus, because I know Jesus calls us to forgiveness. And he said, come pray with me. Come be in our shoes. And it was his gracious invitation that led me over to the victim's side. And his story, just like Bill Pelkey's story of this, all human beings have this tremendous spiritual depth to them, whether they follow institutionalized religion or not. But in Lloyd LeBlanc, it was, he said, I was listening to the people around me. I said, they're right. I wish I could be there to pull the switch. And then he said, I didn't like what was happening to me because he said, I'm a kind person. I love to help people. And all this hatred and bitterness is coming into me. And finally, I just said, nah, -uh. he put his hand like this. No, they killed our boy, but I'm not going to let them kill me. And I'm going to go down the path of forgiveness that Jesus taught us to do. And he was the first victim's family I met. Now I've met hundreds, hundreds of people over these years, victim's families. He was the first one to teach me, though, that what forgiveness is, is not first and foremost what you do for the one that, who's hurt you to lift their burden. 
it's a way of saving your own life. It's a way of preserving wholeness, as we can see in Bill Pelkey. Because then when, and, and Lauren LeBlanc said, he said, people think forgiveness is weak, like you're condoning what they did. He said, it kills you to not to forgive. It was killing me. And he said, because who I am is to be a person who loves people and helps people. And so it was a way of preserving your own life. And it gave me an insight. When Jesus said, love your enemies, it doesn't mean condone what enemies do. Or it's gotten to be like a cliche, you know, that people say, oh, yeah, forgive and forget. But it's not letting the love and integrity of our life be damaged forever by the hate. Sister Helen Prejean and Bill Pelkey, we thank you for being with us. Uh, Bill Pelkey will follow up on whether or not you meet with Paula Cooper. And Helen Prejean, we're going to do part two of this interview after the broadcast and posted at Democracy Now!